Most decisions we make after a certain point in our career, as soon as you get to sort of high level senior manager to that point forward, I swear that's not me. I'm not even standing, do you see me standing there? <laughs> Most of the decisions we make at some point, somewhere between senior manager and first level director, you do not have complete information. You do not know the ways and means, you do not know the resources, you do not know the market changes, you don't know the organizational lines, you don't know a bunch of things. And we're going to start making decisions at that point forward with incomplete information, which means you've got to figure out what your sort criteria is. You've got to embrace uncertainty, because uncertainty is going to be a way of life. And the, and the leaders who say, I need more data, oh my god, they can stay there for a long time. I walked into a team meeting the other day, a um, group of like 25 executives that are fighting a huge fight with Microsoft. And they've been doing this for about two years. They asked us to come in. And so the first question was, okay, so tell us where you are. Because you clearly asked us in, but you haven't told us what you've already tried. So I need to understand what have you already tried. And they said, well, we've been taking a wait and see approach. By the way, that never works. So for any of you. We have a huge defense practice uh, fighting Microsoft. And in fact, that's why they're not one of our clients. Uh, but one of the things that we usually do is recommend at least an offense strategy early on. And the difference between that and standing still, it can be like a 30, 40% market share. We actually have a bunch of examples for that. The clients who don't call us in the first time, but they call us in the second time, is because they lost 30% share the first time. And they're like, we would like to not do that again. <laughs> right? But that's a wait and see approach. I digress. So, so when, we, um, when we think about the incomplete information and that team was sitting there, I, I was like, OK, so what do you know? And they knew a bunch of stuff. And I was like, well, why haven't you acted? it? Like, well, we don't know if that's enough information. I'm like, two years? You've gathered two years of information? You don't know whether you have enough information? What are you waiting for? And that's when they're stuck in the facts loop. Let me see if I can just know more. And you know what they hadn't had a conversation on is what matters? What matters to us? How will we make this decision? How will we sort all the facts? They hadn't had that discussion for two years. So of course they didn't know if they had enough information, right? And they were stuck. Killing. I'm a big believer in the meritocracy system, meaning best idea wins. Not best title, not best looks, not most articulate, not most senior person at the room. Meritocracy of ideas wins every day. When we build those cultures, the tribe really thrives. But it means that that organization has to start figuring out what is it they're willing to toss overboard. They need to learn how to respect all the voices in the room. Every person has something they contribute. The more inclusive we are, the more we can do something better. You know, my, uh, uh, my husband has this really particular habit that when I first met, I didn't appreciate very much, which was to criticize everything I said. And we started out as friends, in fact, the leading school of business, and so I met my husband at grad school. And so there's one big success out of grad school. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but what he would do is sort of criticize, 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 and I finally said, I think I finally get why you're doing it. And let me say it back to you, you're trying to make sure I've shored up on my weak points. He goes, of course. I'm like, ah, oh. okay, so then I learned to respect that voice. And so actually now I go there, you know, kind of bring my idea with a slight Teflon shield next to it, like, okay, please take it apart so that you can, you know, I can get better. Every single voice matters. And when someone's being that critical, if you really look behind their intent, it's almost always for a good reason. People are not inherently evil. They just have their bias. And we really need to learn how to respect all those voices, not just the voices we want to hear. When we come to killing, we actually need to move fast. If you give people like five days to figure out how to eliminate some things on the board for something rel relatively simple, they will sit there and hold on to it till day four and a half. And, uh, and, and one of the things I often work with is GMs and I say, okay, tell me about your goals for the year. And uh, they'll say, well, we're gonna improve our brand and we're gonna ship a bunch of new product and we're gonna do better at sales and we're gonna, and the list goes on. And I'm like, well, thinking, well, what part of the company did you not touch, first of all? And then the second piece is, okay, what are you not going to do? You know how many people cannot answer that question? 
So what do they have their entire 1,000 person, 5,000 person, 10,000 person organization doing? A little bit of everything. Okay. So will you do me a favor, please, and when you go out and become great GMs, remember to put on the list what you're not going to do. It drives everyone crazy that everyone, every part of the organization is trying to do everything. Uh, there's a term in the Valley, which I'm not sure if you guys have heard, the peanut butter spread syndrome. Ah, uh, I see some nodding. Okay, you guys have experienced it. That's what this is all about. If somebody has not gone through and considered what it is they need to stop doing in order to go forward. I actually have this concept trademark called murderboarding, which is the opposite of whiteboarding. There's actually a process you can use to actually eliminate ideas. And in the Valley, you know, you know greatness is happening when someone goes to a whiteboard, right? You can just feel it. Oh, oh! And then you go to the whiteboard and start drawing. That is a great moment in a team. That is a great moment in an innovation process. The corollary of that has to be what is it we're not going to do. Maybe not now. Sometimes I call it purgatory. It can go into purgatory. It can come back. Or the parking lot. It can go in the parking lot. Yeah. People really need to figure out how to get rid of the stuff they're not going to focus on so they can really deliver. Kill. And the final one is is just to be. Just to be. You know, for all of us that have learned that because we're really smart, we're successful. Of course, school reinforces this. You will know more facts when you're done with maybe than any other thing. There's a great course at Leaving for those of you that haven't taken it called Spirituality and Leadership that focuses on the role of the individual leader and how to tap into what really matters to you. So if you haven't taken that course, Andre Del Beck teaches it. It's one of the best courses to talk about how to be a great passionate leader by really tapping into what matters to you. <coughs> your ego is not necessarily your friend. I wish I could find a t-shirt that said that. And if you want to give me a person's present, ego, not friend. Right, because when we're operating from our ego, what we're trying to say is, I'm really smart. I'm really good. What if that was already a point of fact? What if you could get to the point where you're like, I know that. Right, I already know that. Then what am I gonna do? You're not done yet. Go lead other people means you can't be the smartest guy in the room. Or in this case, a gal in the room. By the way, guys do it more than gals. <coughs> and we have to decide that we're going to be an emotionally strong leader. And there's a really good set of uh, work by Daniel Goldman that might help you look at this one more. But I just want you to view that as your parameter of things that you're thinking about to be a great passionate leader. It cannot the, uh, exclude this piece of it. In fact, I just started touching on books. So some resources that might be useful, <laughs> like I don't have enough to read for those of you that are still in grad school. Um, a couple books touching on each of the six pieces I just talked about. And for any of you that want this presentation, by the way, certainly feel free to email me and I'll send it to you. I have no problem with that. But books are kind of a good way to kind of build out a framework in your own head and help you know what it is you don't know. Uh, these are some of my favorites. I could change this and come up with an entirely different six favorites on these topics. Um, the point is to figure out a framework of figuring out what is it you don't know and how to learn that.